Hail, and welcome to Heathen Hearth, the show where we cook recipes inspired by the historic and ethnographic imagination. This week, we have a very interesting recipe inspired by ancient Rome. We're going to be cooking a sauce that is the ancestor of what the Brits call brown sauce and North Americans call steak sauce. It's a sauce that has fruits as well as some very interesting seasonings. <laughs> This week we're going to be engaging in a very interesting experiment that I've never done before. We're going to be making an ancient Roman type of sauce. Now this sauce is not necessarily attested to in the historical sources. However, all of the flavors are and it's very clear that the type of sauces that the Romans enjoyed was this type of sauce. It includes all of the favorite flavors of the ancient Romans. Now, the interesting thing is though that this sauce is very very similar and seems to be the obvious ancestor to things like steak sauce, um, what we call steak sauce in North America, as well as the brown sauce uh, of Britain. So these two sauces are based on something that is very sweet, often there's a molasses or, or fruit component as well as sugar, vinegar and an extreme umami flavor. So. This is gonna be an extremely interesting sauce. I hope it turns out. And now to the ingredients. Here are the ingredients for our Roman brown sauce. These are very interesting. Here we have uh, dates. This provides a lot of sweetness and a dark flavor. We also have um, dark raisins. These are sultanas. So they're a bit of a mix of, um, uh, they're almost in between a red and a white grape. We have also too here some red onions. So in a way, this is a lot like a chutney, especially with these spices here. We have here something that um, I'm using to replace what the Romans would have uh, used. And they would have used something called silphium. Now that herb is actually extinct. It grew mainly in Carthaginian areas in North Africa. And it is very similar to hing, or uh, also called devil's dung, or asafoetida. And um, so I went to an Indian grocery store and got hing. This is the closest thing we have now to uh, silphium. Also too, I have here some cloves. These were tra traded to the Roman Empire. And this was actually more popular in the Roman Empire than um, pepper. This is actually called long pepper and its uh, use is not uh, very common any longer in European cuisines. However, in South Asian cuisines, particularly Tamil uh, or Southeast Asian cuisines, other cuisines of Sri Lanka, this is um, a commonly used spice still. It's called lindi. Uh, in um, uh, as well if you're going to a South Asian grocery store to get it. Another spice uh, or seasoning here is bay leaves. They're also called laurel leaves and these had a lot of symbolic associations to the ancient Romans as well as having a great flavor. I have here also too some white vinegar. Now uh, it's white wine vinegar, I should say. Uh, white vinegar itself is actually made out of the cellulose from uh, trees and you don't want to use that. It's white wine vinegar you want to use, which is made from white grape juice. And here is uh, some red wine. Um, the amounts of the ingredients will all be um, put in uh, the description for you as well. And the last two ingredients are substitutions as well. This one here is a substitution. You'll see this wonderful color and the particulates in it. It's actually an anchovy sauce and it's fermented anchovies. This is uh, to reproduce uh, or substitute for garum, which was a condiment that the Romans used a lot. <clears throat> Now, garum in ancient Rome was also spiced with other types of uh, herbs uh, on occasion. This garum uh, is actually a Filipino product that you can get where Filipino grocery store, uh, groceries are sold. And this is a substitute for liquium, which was another uh, fish-based condiment that the Romans used quite a bit. They were actually produced sometimes in the same facilities because the early runoff from the fermenting fish was used to make the liquam, which was, uh, turns out to be a lot like um, a soya sauce. And then the, um, uh, the solids were used to produce garum. 
Now, you can get uh, this type of sauce, uh, which is close to Lequeum, and this is actually Thai fish sauce. So it's fairly easy to find in most grocery stores nowadays. And those are the ingredients we have for our sauce. Um, we may be using a little bit of water depending on how much volume the, the, all these uh, ingredients um, get when they are together. Turn your Instant Pot on. And we will heat it up now using saute mode for 30 minutes just to get it warmed up and we'll get it to more. And wait for it to beep to make sure that the setting is there and it's on. Now we'll add the ingredients to the pot. All the ingredients are ready to go into the Instant Pot now. I think we'll put the wine in first. The pot's hot here. So we we'll want the wine, uh, it's okay if the wine reduces down a bit. One of the things the Romans had was very thick and sweet wine. They actually had a, um, a specific uh, type of cooking ingredient called defructum, which was a wine syrup that was made from boiling down wine. Uh, this is not exactly that, but it'll have that sort of taste at the end when we thicken it up. Some of our other wet ingredients are the vinegar that's going in now. as well as the garum. Now garum is interesting because it's a fermented product. It smells very, very much like the seashore. Uh, so we'll see how it tastes. Uh, one of the things that uh, is interesting about a lot of these Roman ingredients is that they smell a little bit different than they actually taste. Same thing goes for fish sauce. Now, Thai food has a lot of fish sauce in it, but you wouldn't uh, necessarily consider most of that food fishy tasting. We'll put the red onions in. Here are the bay leaves once they're crushed, or laurel leaves. Of course, the laurel was a symbol of victory, and it was also uh, considered to be lucky and useful. Uh, for many other purposes. Maybe uh, look up some facts and put them uh, down below on the screen for you. This uh, it was the long pepper. I've never used long pepper before. It's very interesting. I'm just smelling it now. It has, the, has a bit of aroma of um, chocolate or carob and mixed with a little bit of the smell of Szechuan peppercorn as well as black pepper. So it's got a very, and also very earthy. So it's a very interesting spice. Uh, we'll see how it uh, comes out and tastes. This is the cloves. Now cloves, they smell uh, fragrant, extremely fragrant and a little bit spicy with a, a hint of a note of bitterness. And they have a taste all their own as well that you're probably familiar with from uh, Christmas spices and pumpkin spice. And this here, I'm not going to smell, well, maybe I'll smell it. This is the uh, hing, is what it's called uh, on the Indian subcontinent. And uh, it is the uh, substitute for sylphium. <coughs> now this smells like, <clears throat> it smells like sulfur. It uh, has a smell of um, a little bit, because of the sulfur, it has an eggy smell. It also has a, a, a mild floral aroma and a distinct smell of foot odor or very, very strong cheese. <clears throat> this also too is called uh, devil's dung. Now this spice is very interesting. It's used in Ayurvedic cooking uh, and, all, um, and medicine as well. And there's a lot of people who have taboos against eating from the allium family, so garlic or onions. And this uh, will be used specifically and especially for people who cannot eat onions. It gives a garlicky type of taste once it's cooked. It's a very different flavor once it's cooked than when it's raw. And then we have our fruit ingredients. These are the dates, which it provides a lot of the sugar and sweetness. You'll notice that there's no sugar in this, uh, uh, in this dish. Uh, however, of course, in modern, um, uh, modern steak, 
uh, spice, uh, steak sauces or brown sauces. There's a lot of sugar. This is all done with fruit. And then we have our raisins. Okay, so that, that seems pretty good. I don't think I'll need to add any water. That's, um, that's a good proportion, I think. So remember, we're on saute mode. What we're going to do is put the lid on our Instant Pot, turn it to ceiling mode, and then we're going to come around to the front so that we can see the changes we're going to be making to the control panel. We have the lid on the Instant Pot. It's still in saute mode, so we're going to have to make some changes. We hit the Keep Warm Cancel button, and that turns that program off. Then we're going to choose Manual Mode here, and we're going to use 20 minutes. So there's um, a standard of 30 minutes and you just have to go down. We see that it's pressure cooking and it's going to be on high. And that's what we want. We'll wait for the beep and we'll know it started. All right, now we just have to wait for it to come to pressure and we'll let the cooking take place for 20 minutes. The cooking process has ended. As you can see here, it's uh, 37 minutes. I've let it naturally pressure release. You can obviously uh, use a quick release too if you'd like. However, I only got back to it after a few minutes of uh, doing video editing. So what I'm gonna do now is um, turn it to venting mode just to make sure there's no pressure. The pin has dropped on top and I'm gonna open the Instant Pot. Let the water drip in. Mm, that looks interesting. It's very much like a wine sauce right now, not extremely thick. We'll have to check to see what it looks like after we blend it. But first, we're going to turn off the setting, turn it to saute mode, and adjust the temperature to more. So our saute mode looks like it's working well. It's boiling down and reducing the amount of liquid in the uh, Instant Pot. It's smelling a little bit festive. It has some of the smells of uh, traditional Christmas um, mulled wine. I'm gonna be using this uh, hand blender here, uh, immersion blender, to um, blend all the fruit together with the sauce. Well, that consistency looks good. I've done a lot of blending, so I'm gonna hit the Instant Pot and turn it off and let it cool down a bit before I put it into bottles. Something to consider is the evolution of Italian cooking. As before the, uh, the Columbus Exchange, before the New World was uh, contacted by uh, Europe in 1492, and they started to uh, exchange uh, plants and animals be between um, Europe, uh, Eurasia, and Africa, and South and North America, was that Italian cooking didn't have tomatoes. And so we, we see um, uh, instead in ancient Roman cuisine, a lot of use of fruits and, and vinegars and wine to get that tangy tang um, in sauces that tomatoes now provide. Another thing tomatoes provide is a flavor intensification and they're a very interesting vegetable because they're fairly unique in that fact. With other types of flavor intensifiers around the world are, are seaweed or uh, soy sauce or other fermented ingredients and one of the key ferme fermented ingredients that the Romans had as a uh, taste intensifiers were both garum and liquam. So we see here in this sauce fruits as well as these flavor intensifiers which is similar, um, uh, fulfills a similar role in the cuisine that later on tomatoes would. And you can imagine also too, fish is actually paired with uh, tomatoes. Uh, in Sicilian uh, tomato gravies, for instance, oftentimes the sauce is started with uh, fermented anchovy fillets that are cooked into the onion and garlic before the, um, before the tomatoes are added. So, if this is, it may look a little bit strange, but when you think about the evolution of a cuisine, it's, uh, it isn't actually that bizarre. All right, the brown sauce has uh, cooled a little bit. It's still very warm. I wanted to do that so it would go into the bottles and be fairly sterile. Now, I had considered putting it in uh, narrow, um, narrow neck bottles that are a lot like the ones used for steak sauce, 
but I tried that and I failed. So I'm going to be using jars like this and uh, just be transferring it into these jars. Okay, it's time for the tasting of our Roman brown sauce. Let's see how it turned out. It's uh, 24 hours later and it's been uh, sitting in the fridge so that the flavors can marry. And you'll notice here I have my good friend Baz, who is the guinea pig for this uh, experiment. I have never made this recipe before. And some of these ingredients I have never actually used before. I'm excited. You are excited? Yeah. Okay, all it. right. So um, maybe we can show the camera what we've got here. I'll just uh, show it a bit closer. There we go. I took the brown sauce and just put it on a cracker. It can be used lots of different ways. Um, a common way to be to use it with meat, but I uh, figured I'd try it uh, a bit like a uh, savory jam here. Let's try it out. Okay, you try yours first, so I can keep talking. Okay. So, like, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't need to put the spinach on this. I just did it to make it look pretty. You know the Instagram thing. Hmm. So. That's really good. It is really tangy. It's like a. Almost like a sweet barbecue sauce kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It has some, um, like I can taste the cloves, but then the long pepper that I put in, I've never used that before. Yeah. And it's not hot like pepper. When I smelled it, when I was making it, it smelled a little chocolatey. Hmm. And it does have a little sort of like a mole kind of sauce yeah, taste to this. Yeah, it tastes a lot like mole sauce. Mm -hmm. yeah. But no, no nuts were put in this. Right, so it does have that mole sauce kind of. It's like a really dark, earthy kind of flavor. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a little bit refreshing too. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, it's, it doesn't it doesn't look like it tastes either. No, no, it tastes bright yeah. and it's dark, but it's earthy. Mm -hmm. Like it's a really weird combination that we don't really get in our cuisines much anymore. Like. HP sauce tastes a little bit like it, but that just tastes like, that has like sucrose sugar kind of taste. Yeah, it's, it's sweet, but not in a sugary way. Mm-hmm. Because uh, all the sweetness comes from the dates and the, um, and the raisins. So there's a, there's no honey, no sugar or anything put in it. Anyways, that, um, that's a good way to serve it, actually. Um, I'm going to try, it, I've got lots of it. So we're going to try it a lot of different ways to serve it. Um, you'll see it on other episodes, maybe making an appearance. And one of the things I was wondering is, do you have some sort of dish where the secret ingredient is fermented fish? Did you notice there was fermented fish in this? No, you can't even taste it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just adds that underlying flavor that binds flavors together and provides that sort of level of, uh, just raises the intensity of all the other flavors. So what dish do you make with fermented fish as a secret <laughs> ingredient, if you have one? Anyways, it's been uh, great uh, being with you this week, and uh, we'll see you again on another episode of Heathen Hearth. I hope you liked that video. Please give it a thumbs up down below, and I'd love to hear your comments as well. Also too, remember to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell so you get notifications. You might like this video as well, so check it out. There's also playlists, so you can check those out as well. Until next time, keep cooking.